Welcome to Fast Thinking. I'm Niels Graham with the Jew Economic Center. Semiconductors have become essential to our daily lives. These tiny, incredibly complex silicon chips serve as the electronic brains in everything from our computers to our cars, where driver assist systems and GPS are now becoming standard in many models. These days, more than 40% of a car's manufacturing costs involve parts that rely on a semiconductor. So, when there's a shortage of semiconductors, as the world has been experiencing in recent months, it's a big problem. These shortages are one outgrowth of the COVID pandemic, where staying at home has sharply increased the demand for laptop, screens, and other digital devices. Now that the global economy is rebounding, the chip shortages have become more acute as demand for a wider range of products rises. There are geopolitical repercussions as well. The reliance on the global semiconductor supply chain has heightened tensions between the US and China. On today's episode of Fast Thinking, we're gonna take a closer look at these issues by addressing two fundamental questions. What is the future of U.S. semiconductor manufacturing? And what are the implications of the Biden administration's semiconductor policy for U.S.-China strategic competition? Joining me today is Jeremy Mark, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center. Before we turn to the future of the semiconductor industry, can you give me a bit more background on the situation that has placed semiconductor supply chains in the spotlight? The COVID pandemic had a profound impact on the global economy. It transformed consumer behavior and upset the expectations and the forecasts of companies across a wide range of industries. Automobiles have gotten the most attention as a result of this because they experienced a deep decline in sales early in the pandemic and then cut back on their orders of parts, including their semiconductors, and then experienced a very rapid rebound in sales that they were not expecting. By the time that they were responding to that increased demand, they no longer had the ability to increase their orders of semiconductors. Other companies had similar experiences. Many of the companies, for example, that were producing the stay-at-home products like laptop computers, screens, webcams, et cetera. But there were other industries that also experienced very, very strong demand that wasn't really related to COVID. We're talking about the advent of 5G mobile phone technology, the rapid increase in demand for artificial intelligence semiconductors, and the growth of high-end computers and servers. A lot of this was cutting edge chips, which put great demand on the companies uh, in Asia and in the U.S. that produce a lot of these chips. But also we were seeing more mundane chips for which the, the older generations of production technology was used. The end result of this was this very strong demand for semiconductors. The Chinese stockpiling of chips has also been a very important factor. The uh, Chinese smartphone manufacturer Huawei bought a massive amount of chips from Taiwan before the September 2020 ban on sales imposed by the U.S. came into effect. Chinese semiconductor imports last year could have been as high as $350 billion, up from $300 billion a year before. Much of this is coming from Taiwan. Mother Nature also played an important part as well. The ice storms Texas experienced in February led to power outages that shut semiconductor plants throughout the state. It wasn't until late March before Samsung's facilities, for example, were running back to normal. On top of this, a plant run by Renaissance Electronics, a major provider of automotive chips, was also damaged by a fire in March, disrupting production for weeks. Finally, Taiwan suffered its worst drought in decades, which added additional strain to its manufacturing capacity. Now, Jeremy, I know these disasters were one-off incidents. What are some other effect factors affecting supply? Well, supply has been the crux of the issue, Niels. There was a time when the U.S. was a major producer of, of many different forms of semiconductors. Uh, at about a decade ago, the U.S. was making about 40 percent of, of semiconductors worldwide. But that figure is now down to about 12 percent. And instead, Taiwan and South Korea have emerged as the major semiconductor producers. A lot of the U.S. companies, companies like Apple, uh, AMD, soon to be Intel, are having producers in Taiwan and South Korea make their chips under contract. The result has been that the, these two countries have emerged as the major semiconductor producers along with China. 
China is producing much lower technology chips than the, their competitors in Asia. And they play a much larger role in, shall we say, ancillary areas of the industry like testing and packaging and assembly. So what does all this mean? It means that essentially there are a very small number of production facilities that are doing high-end chips in Taiwan, in South Korea, that U.S. companies, European companies, other Asian companies rely on. The U.S. military relies on Taiwan's Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, TSMC, for some of its most sophisticated chips. And we recently learned that the Chinese military as well is relying on the same company. So we have both countries turning to Taiwan for, for advanced chips. This is a, a situation that essentially is untenable because there is simply not a pr enough production capacity for all demand to be met. Now, Niels, on this question, is there any prospect of short-term relief for the, for the supply shortages? Unfortunately, Jeremy, probably not. There really is no short-term solution to the supply chain problems. These are incredibly complex devices, so you can't just open a new plant and start producing semiconductors. Total semiconductor manufacturing capacity was only set to rise around 6% this year. Accelerated capital spending and a revision of expansion plans could double that, but even so, the lion's share of this capacity will not come online until the second half of the year, and much of this growth will be concentrated in China. So Jeremy, what is the future of the US semiconductor industry? That really depends on how we define the future. The big issue right now is meeting the demand for cutting edge chips from both the private sector, the companies that need it, as well as the defense uh, industry, for example, the US military. The Biden administration is very aware of this issue. They, they understand that there are national security implications to relying on the Asian chip producers. They also are very worried that the Chinese themselves are turning to the same producers to get the high-end chips. How you can address the immediate needs is a question of not just expanding production in Taiwan and South Korea, but also expanding production in the U.S. TSMC from Taiwan and Samsung Electronics from South Korea have production bases in Taiwan and are now expanding them. Uh, TSMC is building an advanced plant in Arizona and has plans that could involve as many as five more. Samsung is expanding its production capacity in Texas significantly. The U.S., though, sees this as more than just a matter of having the Taiwanese and the South Koreans producing semiconductors. They'd like the American industry to produce more. And I would add that companies like Apple, AMD, uh, Intel, and others are also looking to have more suppliers in order to have greater, greater variety of, of producers. The U.S. Senate currently has legislation before it to provide $52 billion to help the production of semiconductors in this country. They're also talking about funding R&D for future technology. The issue really comes down to whether the, that is enough money to compete with Taiwan and South Korea. That $52 billion is essentially equivalent to what TSMC spends every two years on advancing its production capabilities. So. The, the issue really is, does it make sense to put money into catching up with the Asian producers, or should the focus be on next generation advanced technology, things like quantum computing or advanced uh, materials for new forms of semiconductors? The issue becomes, should they be reinventing the wheel, or should they be looking beyond the wheel to the technologies that will be important later in this century? Niels, the other issue we have before us is what are the implications of Biden administration policy for the U.S.-Chinese competition? Well, Jeremy, with semiconductors, we're really talking about an industry that is deeply embedded in an international ecosystem that has taken decades to grow. Chips often go back and forth across borders during the manufacturing process, sometimes going from the U.S. to Taiwan to Malaysia or to Singapore and China before reaching the end consumer. Many U.S. companies also have major stakes in China's industry often though with technology that's not a strategic threat. Qualcomm and Intel, for example, are producing lower levels of sophistication in China. Apple devices are being assembled in China on a massive scale. 
One Taiwanese company, Foxconn, employs more than 1 million workers to assemble iPhones, iPads, and MacBooks. Can the world decouple supply chains that are so deeply embedded in many economies? Ultimately, removing semiconductors from this supply chain is like removing water from agriculture. The strategic calculus about the U.S.-China relationship has shifted dramatically over the past four or five years. We're in a situation now that we're no longer talking in terms of cooperation, but competition. Kurt Campbell, the, the, the Asia czar in the National Security Council, said the other day that the era of engagement with China is over and that technology is the core issue in the competition that now exists. Uh, there is a consensus in the U.S that steps have to be taken to limit China's access to semiconductor technology, both cutting edge chips and the equipment that's used to make them. In other words, to slow down the growth of China's own semiconductor industry. But if there's significant disruptions to the semiconductor supply chains that now exist, we face a situation in which the global economy itself could, could face disruptions. So. Even though this can consensus exists that there's a need to constrain China's ability to access semiconductors, the question becomes, is there a middle ground that will not force a complete rupture in supply chains? One way forward, which I know that has been discussed in various circles in Washington, is to focus on limiting supplies of the most advanced chips and the advanced semiconductor equipment. The U.S. has a lot of experience dealing with the export of dual-use technology to countries like the Soviet Union, other technology to China. And so the issue really becomes whether the bureaucracies that are involved in this process are able to get fully engaged with a focus on the technologies that are seen as most germane to U.S. national security interests. At the same time, it's very, very important that there be uh, an effort to expand diplomacy among U.S. partners in the region, particularly South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan, which is a key supplier of raw materials for semiconductors. If this is possible, then going forward, it's possible there may be this middle ground which allows the semiconductor supply chains to continue with some limitations on the exact technology that flows to China. Well, Jeremy, this has been an incredibly insightful discussion. Thank you again for joining me today. Thank you, Niels.